Good morning, and welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We're reading and discussion, uh, discussing the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And we've just begun our, our discussion about how Roman Catholicism got planted in the colonies. And we're discussing the colony of Virginia, and the Protestant colony of Virginia, and the Roman Catholic colony of Maryland. Now, beginning on the first full paragraph on page 675, if you're following along, the author says the conditions of things existing in the colony of Virginia was not at all satisfactory to the king. The first legislative assembly had met at Jamestown in 1619, each borough sending a representative. The impulse given to popular freedom by this means excited his apprehension that the monarchical principles he desired to plant in the New World might be endangered. So we have the king of England is afraid that these, though they were Protestant as he was, these colonists of Virginia were establishing their own legislative assembly, and he saw that as a threat to his monarchical, sovereign, divine right to rule the colony of Virginia. So, manifestly, there is a controversy arising now between the, the government of England and the new government of Virginia. Remember, Virginia espoused Protestantism, the Church of England, and enforced that religion by law. And uh, Catholicism was <laughs> not the, the religion of Virginia. In other words, Roman Catholics were suppressed in Virginia as they were in England. It says, The king manifestly feared that if the right of representation in the, in, in the colonial legislature were granted to the people, it would in the end result in organizing a formidable opposition to his own authority. And being a monarchist in the strictest sense, he therefore resolved at once to bring the colonists into complete subjection. For this purpose, he resorted to several wrongful and oppressive measures. He commanded that a number of felons, unfit to remain in England, should be transported to the colony, and also made the most grinding exactions upon the people in order to draw off their wealth and thereby to supply his own treasury. This injustice, which violated the chartered rights of the colonists, they could not endure without remonstrance. And when they did undertake to set forth their grievances and to appeal to the settled principles of the law of England for protection, they were regarded as seditious. This furnished a pretext in 1622 for an attempt to destroy the Charter. The first step to this end was to establish in England the entire governing power of the colony, and thus deprive the people of all agency in making their own laws and managing their own affairs, which was secured to them in the Charter as pertaining to the, quote, privileges, franchises, liberties, and immunities, unquote, which belong to all Englishmen. This scheme of government as a substitute for the charter was laid before the colonists who were told that if they did not accept it, they would be crushed by the power of the king. Not at all intimidated by this threat, they rejected the proposal with indignation, being resolved to cling to their chartered rights. The king, therefore, the king, therefore, found it necessary to resort to a more direct measure. He caused a writ of quo warranto to be issued from the court of the king's bench in England to declare the charter forfeited. The colonists could not, of course, make any successful defense to this, for the king could easily find the means in those days to bring the judges over to the royal side if they were otherwise inclined. 
the English law gave the court no jurisdiction over the whole body of colonists, and they rightfully decided to treat whatever judgment should be pronounced against them as null and void. The judgment of forfeiture was arbitrarily rendered in 1625, just before the death of King James I, but no steps were taken toward its execution before that event. Charles I, who succeeded him, took up the matter where his father had left it, and in one of his proclamations assigned all the misfortunes in the colony to what he called, quote, corporate democracy, unquote blaming democracy, the right of the people to decide their own affairs, such is the usual condition of monarchists and divine writers. And he continues, he says, his principal effort, therefore, was to destroy entirely the representative form of government inaugurated in 1619. To this end, he appointed a governor and council with powers as royal as he himself possessed. But the people were determined not to give up their general assembly, and it continued to meet at regular periods, passing such laws as we have seen in strict conformity with those of England. They cherished the rights of Englishmen too fervently to surrender them at the mere dict dictation of the royal power or in obedience to the illegal judgment of a court subservient to it. In 1628, Lord Baltimore visited Virginia. This nobleman was a monarchist both from inclination and education. He was so devoted to the interests of the king as to have become a special favorite of both King James I and King Charles I. He had made he had many excellent and ennobling qualities which made him exceedingly popular. In 1624, only four years before, he had become a Roman Catholic. When he reached Virginia, he found the English Episcopal Church established by law, and also a legal requirement that, in becoming a citizen, he should take the English oath of supremacy. This he could not do consistently with his new religious convictions. All right, this Lord Calvert was a Roman Catholic, a brand new Roman Catholic, and you must know as a new convert to Roman Catholicism, he was very zealous of his new faith. And the oath of supremacy was a violation of, a, of his new religious conscience because it denied the power and infallibility of the Pope. Okay? Now it says he was willing, as all the papists in, Ling in England were, to take a le uh, the oath of allegiance, that is, the oath of allegiance to the king, which involved merely the support of the kingly prerogative, but not that of supremacy. In other words, they could take a, a, a pledge of an oath of allegiance to the king, but the oath of supremacy, the oath of supremacy literally caused them, in effect, to deny the power of the pope. See, it's one, it's one thing to be loyal to the king of England, but it's quite another thing to renounce the authority of the pope. That's what we're talking about. Two separate oaths. The oaths of allegiance and the oath of supremacy. It says this he could not do consistently with his new religious convictions. He was willing, as all the papists in England were, to take the oath of allegiance, which involved merely the support of the kingly prerogative, but not that of the papacy, which denied the authority of the pope. Consequently, he did not unite himself with the colonists. But being delighted with the climate, soil, and scenery about the Chesapeake Bay and Potomac River, he formed the design of obtaining a charter from King Charles, authorizing him to make a settlement there in entire disregard of the rights of the Virginia colony. So, 
here we have the first indication that the Maryland colony, the Roman Catholic Maryland colony, was simply carved out of the existing Virginian colony. The Virginian colony being Protestant and the, and the Maryland colony being Catholic. So we're going to see real contention here. Land that has already been under charter as Protestant and owned and settled by Protestant occupants is now going to be given to Roman Catholics. Okay. Now it says, upon that question, being a monarchist, he, of course, took sides with the king, both having an equal an equal disregard for the rights of the people when they came in conflict with the prerogatives of royalty. He relied manifestly upon his well-known devotion to these principles for his success with the king. And in this he was not disappointed, for King Charles I was not only disposed to oblige him personally, but was resolved upon punishing the seditious colonists of Virginia, notwithstanding they rigidly maintained the religious worship established by the laws of England. So, in order to make sure my listeners are following this, the Virginians, the only thing they did to offend the King of England was to establish their own parliament. Establishing their own parliament, their own legislative body, within the colony was seen by the king as a usurpation of his power or a threat to his power, even though this legislation passed laws equivalent to those in England. So there was apparently no uh, contradiction between those sets of laws, but it was only based on the threat that a that a that a le- an independent legislative body in Virginia posed to the to the king's authority in England to govern. Now the Maryland uh, Lord Baltimore wanted to serve the king and acknowledged his divine right royalty, and that pleased the king. And now the king is willing to go against his conscience, so to speak, believing, just taking for granted that he was in truth Protestant, and he was willing to allow the Catholics to make a colony out of the land already possessed by the Virginians, simply because... Lord Baltimore was loyal to the crown. Now, the charter to Lord Baltimore was granted in 1632, but in consequence of his death, it was transferred to his son, who took his title. It granted the tract of country lying on both sides of the, of the Chesapeake Bay and north of the Potomac, up to the 40th parallel of latitude, the whole of which was within the limits of the Virginia colony. This charter contained the celebrated provision that while Christianity was made the law of the colony, yet no preference should be given to any sect, but equally in religious but equality in religious rights no less than in civil freedom was secured. All right, so the law guaranteeing religious liberty pertained to Christianity, and no preference was to be given to any sect. So that, in effect, gave, erased the distinction between Catholicism and Protestantism. You see, this is why I believe it is an error to consider. Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, to be Christianity. It is not Christianity. And anyone in the, in the Catholic Church who understands the true nature of the Roman Catholic Church will admit to you, I'm not a Christian, 
I am a Roman Catholic. It's not the religion of Jesus Christ. It's not the faith of Jesus Christ. It is the faith of Antichrist. And the world is confused, believing that Roman Catholicism is Christianity, just as they were confused during the colonial period, and made no distinction between Christianity and Antichrist, and anti-Christianity. They erased the distinction between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, calling them both Christianity and then making sure that no Christian, quote-unquote, Christian sect was given special treatment or, or was allowed to be persecuted. Now, many people are going to find my speech on this subject to be inflammatory because we've been brought up to believe that there is religious liberty in this country when there is no such thing. Roman Catholicism, when it gains the upper hand, always, I repeat, always, repeat after me, always persecutes non-Catholics. There's no such thing as religious liberty or religious conscience, a freedom of conscience in the Roman Catholic Church. It's forbidden under Roman Catholic canon law. As a matter of fact, as we've already read, the third canon of the Fourth Vatican, or the Fourth Lateran Council, Made it, made it a salvific issue, made it a sin unto damnation for a Catholic not to kill a heretic. The duty of every Roman Catholic is to kill and extirpate and annihilate the, the non-Catholics. But here in the colonial period, when the, the Catholics were an extreme minority... There had to be religious tolerance. We had to regard the Catholics as Christians, equal with Protestants. And we had to give them land that was already settled by Protestants. Uh, and a land that, was, that Protestantism was made the law of the land. You see how this is taking place? We've covered some of this same ground in the Roman Catholic book, uh, the, the Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives. That was a Roman Catholic book written by a Roman Catholic to be read by Roman Catholics. That book was hard for me to get a hold of. And I believe the Lord made sure that I had a copy of that book at an affordable price. And I read it on the air knowing what it revealed was important. And here R.W. Thompson is covering some of the same ground. It says, this charter contained the celebrated provision that while Christianity, Christianity, making no distinction now between Protestant and Catholic, the provision that while Christianity was made the law of the colony, yet no preference should be given to any sect but equality in religious rights, no less than in civil freedom, was secured. This constitutes the groundwork of the Roman Catholic claim of toleration in the United States. Look, Roman Catholicism has never been tolerant. It cannot be tolerant on pain of excommunication and eternal damnation. But they needed religious toleration at the time of the colonial period for Catholicism to even get a foothold, because the rest of the colonies were Protestant. Now, it says a critical examination of it will demonstrate not only that this claim is groundless, but also what was understood by Charles I and the elder Lord Baltimore by giving security to civil freedom in Maryland. In other words, by granting the right of legislation to those Roman Catholics who should emigrate to the colony. So the Catholics are going to be given the right to legislation. You see the uneven-handedness of this? It says, The English oath of supremacy had been established 100 years before the date of this charter. 
This oath required that every subject should recognize the king as the supreme head of the Church of England, that the Pope of Rome had no more jurisdiction than any other bishop, and that obedience to him should be renounced. This was not only the law in England, but it was also the law in the colony of Virginia. It was because of this that Lord Baltimore could not become a citizen of the colony of Virginia. Now, when this and the further fact that the territory granted to him was within the limits of the Virginia colony are observed, it will be seen that he could have accomplished no possible object designed by him without a provision for religious toleration in his charter. He was about to undertake a settlement in a region of the New World where there was an existing form of religion established by law, which in his conscience he entirely repudiated, which he had renounced only four years before as contrary to the law of God and which, if he remained true to his new religious convictions and papal obedience, he would feel it his duty not merely to oppose, but to exterminate. Like other papists of that day, and the advocates of the Pope's infallibility now, he favored religious toleration in a Protestant country, that is, such toleration as would enable him to maintain the cause of the papacy in the midst of Protestantism as a means of rooting out the Protestant religion and securing the establishment of the Roman Catholic, of the Roman Catholic religion by law. And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly where we are today. R. W. Thompson, just as J. Moss Ives in the book the, uh, the Ark and the Dove, understood what the, Rome, what the Roman Catholic Maryland colony was all about. He understands that the Protestant king of England sold out Protestantism and the Protestant colony of Virginia in order to give it give it over to Maryland so that Catholicism could get a firm root in the country for the eventual Catholicization of the entire nation and the extirpation and annihilation of Protestantism. I want my listeners to realize that what we're take what is taking place during this colonial period is rank aggressive Counter-Reformation. Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. And it was subtly imposed in the colonies. And as we continue reading what R.W. Thompson reveals, I'm sure you'll be appalled at the injustices that were perpetrated upon Protestants, even in this early age when Catholicism was an extreme minority you will see the brazenness and intolerance of the Roman Catholics in the Maryland colony early on. Had it continued, it might have been the ruination of Catholicism in the country. And we'll continue with the reading of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, when we return to the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Years ahead of the dominant media, FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. 
So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone. Absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today. So you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Okay, welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. If you love Inquisition Update, pray for me but send your contributions to First Amendment Radio to help offset the cost of producing the program. Now, speaking of Lord Baltimore, this Roman Catholic, this new fledgling Roman Catholic, enthusiastic about his faith, is going to obtain a a charter for the Maryland Colony from, for all intents and purposes, a Protestant king in England. But I got to tell you, J. Moss Ives and other historians like John Daniel and others recognize that even King James I, not to mention his son, King Charles I, had Catholic leanings. They professed Protestantism and rejected the authority of the Pope, but they were still divine writers, they were still monarchists believed in the divine right to rule, and they would not allow their authority to be usurped. And both King James I and Charles I, as much as it was possible, pleaded the cause of Catholicism. Were they secret Catholics? I'll let my listeners decide for themselves and do their own research on the matter. But we're going to see some real uneven-handedness Now, as we continue, Lord Baltimore, like other papists of that day, and the advocates of the Pope's infallibility now, he favored religious toleration in a Protestant country. Okay, they recognized this as a Protestant country. And these Catholics recognized religious toleration which is a diametric opposition to Roman Catholic canon law. There's nothing about toleration in canon law. It's all about extirpation and annihilation of the heretics. This is completely out of character for any true Roman Catholic to preach religious toleration, especially in a Protestant country, except for 
reasons of expedience. They were in a Protestant country. They were an extreme minority. They could easily have been wiped out. It says, like other papists of that day and the advocates of the Pope's infallibility now, he favored religious toleration in a Protestant country. That is, such toleration as would enable him to maintain the cause of the papacy in the midst of Protestantism as the means of rooting out the Protestant religion and securing the establishment of the Roman Catholic religion by law. That's where we are today. It says his only means of getting rid of the oath of supremacy in the colony of Virginia was to get the king so far to set it aside without authority of law and by his royal will alone as to allow him to colonize part of the territory with Roman Catholics. This being at that time the only possible means of introducing that class of population into the colonies. Hence, the provision for religious toleration was a matter of necessity, not choice, with Lord Baltimore. So he said the same thing that I've said, and the same thing that J.F. Uh, J. Moss Ives have said, the same thing that John Daniels has said, the same thing that other historians have said, that it was a temporary expedient engaged in by the Roman Catholic Church, by Lord Baltimore, to propound religious toleration only as an opportunity to see to it that Roman Catholicism got its root in the colonies so that at a future date it could grow and prosper and to eventually Catholicize the country by law going back to the traditional Roman Catholicism. No toleration, no religious liberty, no, re no freedom of conscience, no freedom of religion, no freedom of speech, no freedom to keep and to bear arms. You see any of that happening today? R.W. Thompson, J. Moss Ives, John Daniel, and the other historians knew and know exactly what's taking place in this country. I want my listeners to know what's taking place in this country. Protestantism is the target of the New World Order. The extirpation and annihilation of Bible-believing Protestant Christians are the, are the ones going to be sacrificed. It's the very reason why this program is called Inquisition Update. There's an Inquisition coming to once Protestant America because it's become Catholic now, thanks to Vatican Council II and the Jesuit-led Counter-Reformation. The Protestants have been lulled to sleep with the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy that Antichrist doesn't come until the last seven years. And besides, they're all going to be raptured out. They're not worried about Antichrist, and Antichrist has under, uh, undermined their government, has turned the whole government Antichrist, and now they're going to start killing Bible-believing Protestants. It's history repeating itself all over again. And here we're reading... In this book, R.W. Thompson's book, the same things we read out of the Roman Catholic book by J. Moss Ives. This, this whole idea of religious liberty brought into this country by the Roman Catholic colony of Maryland and Lord Baltimore and the Jesuit Andrew White and, and, and the Jesuit priest John Carroll was only done for expedience. They never intended for there to be religious liberty in this country, only for a time so that Roman Catholicism could grow and get the upper hand. This is, this is probably the most important information that you're ever going to hear. And you can bet your booty Alex Jones is not going to talk about it. This is the root cause of the overthrow of this government and this, this, this country. This is why they're, they're bringing this country down, spiritually, economically, militarily, and every other way. They're going to make this country Catholic by force if they have to starve us in order to do it. 
hearts. Now, on the part of the king, there was one principal object to be obtained by the establishment of the new colony, Maryland. As Lord Baltimore was a thorough monarchist, it was expected of him that he would check the tendency among the Virginian colonists toward popular liberty, and so employ the right of legislation granted to the Maryland colonists as to preserve the monarchical principle, which Charles well understood to be an established feature of the papal system. Okay? So the target of, of this Maryland colony was to destroy popular liberty in a Protestant colony and to uphold monarchism, which is a principal component of popery. The Pope cannot govern the world unless he has control of the, of the civil power. That's the title of this book, The Papacy and the Civil Power. It is the union of the Roman Catholic Church with the state governments of every nation that, that allows the papacy to control the world. Monarchism is the necessary feature of the papal system. There must be a union of church and state. Listen, this is easy to understand. The Vatican's only 108 acres. It doesn't have an army to conquer the world from Rome. They have to infiltrate every nation. They have to subtly, over time, overthrow until they gain the ascendancy. And then all bets are off. No more religious liberty. It's inquisition, execution, annihilation, extirpation. And they do it with religious zeal because they believe that they're conquering the world for Christ. When in fact they're conquering it for the Pope. The biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. Okay, the Maryland colony was to uphold the monarchical principle. Okay, and King Charles I, the son of, of uh, King James I, well understood monarchism, mar monarchism to be an established and I will add the word necessary feature of the papal system. He says, This object was so near the heart of Charles that he was quite willing that the established religion, Protestantism, should be sacrificed if it could be done in no other way. So how loyal a Protestant was King Charles? How loyal of a Protestant was King James I? He was willing to... to allow the Protestant faith of Virginia to be set aside if Maryland, the governor of Maryland, Lord Baltimore, would uphold monarchism because monarchism is a necessary component of popery. I think it's easy to assert what King Charles' priority was. It was to uphold the papacy. And certainly... That was the goal of Lord Baltimore, and certainly was the goal of the Maryland colony. And history has proven this to be true. He says, although he had no power by the law of England to set aside the oath of supremacy, we're speaking of King Charles now, yet he could even venture to defy the authority of Parliament in order to punish the Virginia colonists for daring to assert their just rights as Englishmen. He may indeed have had, and possibly did have, another motive beyond this. The subversion of the English church in the colonies and the establishment of the Roman Catholic by law. It is very well known to the readers of English history that both King Charles I and his father, King James I, while professedly Protestants, were inclined to favor the papists as far as they dared to go. During the reign of Charles I, the laws were not executed against Catholics. Remember, there were laws passed in England suppressing Roman Catholicism. They couldn't say Mass. 
they closed the Catholic churches, or rather took over the Catholic churches and made them Protestant, made them answer to the king. All right? It says, during the reign of Charles, the laws were not executed against... Catholics couldn't hold a political office in England. They couldn't hold respons- uh, positions of responsibility in the government because they, they understood that the first loyalty of every Roman Catholic is to the Pope, which undermined the, the, king, the, the, the power of the king. So those laws that were in place were not enforced by King Charles I. He says, During the reign of Charles, the laws were not executed against them, and they were allowed to go unpunished for refusing to take the oath of supremacy whenever they consented to swear allegiance to him. By this latter oath, they assured themselves of his royal favor to such an extent that they contributed greatly toward the general policy of his administration. They were allowed publicly to celebrate Mass at Somerset House, especially under the royal protection. A papal nuncio resided in London, and his house was their general rendezvous. The queen was an acknowledged and fanatical papist. The wife of Charles I was a fanatical papist. So there is another huge influence upon Charles I to favor these Catholics in the colony. It is therefore quite certain that they materially aided the convocation and the arch. Uh, they aid materially aided the convocation and Archbishop Loud in implanting in the mind of Charles an intense hatred of the uh, Presbyterians and Puritans. And as the influence of the latter was beginning about that time to create a sentiment in the Plymouth colony like that in Virginia in favor of the principles of popular government, it was probably an easy matter for Lord Baltimore to obtain from Charles the Charter of 1632. Both of them thought alike upon the political questions likely to be involved in the settlement of the new colony, and these were considered by Charles as of more consequence than the religious worship established by the English law. So in this count, at least, King Charles I sold out Protestantism in favor of Roman Catholicism. And it says, thus, when all these facts are taken into account, the conclusion is a natural, if not unavoidable one that the insertion of the provision in favor of religious toleration in the Maryland Charter was alone for the objects and the purposes already suggested. That is to make sure Roman Catholicism got a solid, protected, and kingly sanctioned footing in the colonies. To eventually take over the country. And it says, so far as Lord Baltimore himself was concerned, it was undoubtedly a necessity with him. He did not take it in that form because he favored religious toleration in a broad and liberal sense, even if he did so favor it, but because it was the only mode by which he could maintain Roman Catholicism in opposition to the existing law of the Virginia colony. And the existing law of the Virginia colony was Protestantism. It says, by precisely the same process of reasoning as may have influenced him, uh, may have influenced him, Pope Pius IX is in favor of religious toleration in the United States, but not at Rome. And so with his hierarchy all over the world. So you can clearly see that even Pope Pius IX was cooperating with this temporary expedient called religious liberty simply for the sake of the Roman Catholics in the colony with an ulterior motive as when such time arose that they could do away with that expedience and make the country Catholic. Rome did not enjoy religious liberty. It's always been Roman Catholic by law. Protestants have been persecuted there. 
The people couldn't think for themselves. The papal states were ruled by the iron boot of the Pope. And if Pope Pius IX made a pretense of religious liberty in this country, you've got to know it has to be a mere pretense because Roman Catholic canon law forbids religious liberty. The decrees of the popes, the pseudo-Isidorian decretals were created for the very purpose of seeing to it that there would be no religious liberty. The Fourth Lateran Council was established to see to it that Roman Catholics would be dedicated in defense of the papacy to exterminate heresy. Protestantism. The Jesuits were created in 1540 for the very purpose of destroying Protestantism and elevating the papacy to world supremacy. And King Charles I is cooperating with that. Lord Baltimore is cooperating with that. John Carroll is cooperating with that. Andrew White is cooperating with that. The whole Maryland colony is cooperating with that. They only had to concede for a time religious toleration. Let me tell you, when they get in power, there'll be no religious toleration. There'll be no religious toleration. And the same people that were sought to be murdered during the extirpation of the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Huguenots, the, the, the Hussites, the Wycliffeites, the Protestants, is going to take place right here in Protestant America. Inquisition update. Come to this program every day to get an update on the progress of the Inquisition that's coming to the United States today. It's happening right now. Religious persecution, the destruction of Protestant rights, the destruction of the Bill of Rights, the destruction of the Constitution, and our representative form of government to be replaced by a monarchy, a papal monarchy. And in order to get it done... They either have to confiscate our guns or they have to insert chaos to the point that we all kill one another to leave them to rule in our absence without resistance. She kind of sheds a new and understandable light on this gun issue right now, doesn't it? You see, they don't care, one way or another, whether we voluntarily turn in our guns to the churches or whether we buy guns and ammunition until they can't make them fast enough. Because they know on the one hand, if we, if we, if we voluntarily surrender our weapons, we defeat ourselves. And if we buy guns and ammunition and start a civil war in this country, we defeat ourselves. It's a no-win situation except for those who understand who the enemy is. Who is the biblical Antichrist? Who is it that wants to destroy Protestantism in this country? Who is it that wants to destroy the King James Bible and the worship of the true Christ, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and to replace him with a mere man, a sinful, wicked, killing institution, the papacy? That's what this is all about. And it doesn't matter to them what side of the gun issue they're on. They're going to defeat you because they've got you headed in either direction. And both will result in victory for them. And what must be maintained with the utmost secrecy is that the papacy is behind it all. That the people must not ever discover. They must send us down rat holes, talking about nameless, faceless organizations, the Council on Foreign... Oh, here's the favorite one, the powers that be. 
Everybody says the powers that be. They don't want you to know who the power is. I want you to know who the power is. It's the same one that dominated all of Europe during the Middle Ages, the same one that, that, that led England to war after war after civil war, and is now ready to wage war in this country. It is the papacy, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the Jesuits, and all the governments, government institutions in this country that they control. It was what led the Vatican Council to ecumenical movement to take the futurists, believing uh, evangelicals, and absorb them back into the Roman Catholic Church. And they together, the Roman Catholic Church, plus the ecumenical evangelical bellies, are the ones who are going to disarm us. They're the ones who are going to be preaching, we need to disarm. And they're the ones who are going to be jamming me off the frequency every time I'm on ham radio, telling them who the real enemy is. Roman Catholics and ecumenical evangelical bellies, there's hardly a difference between them anymore. You see what they do? You see what they're doing in this country? And the only hope is that Bible-believing Christians stand upon their faith and their Bible, proclaim, as did all the Protestant Reformers, that the papacy is the biblical Antichrist and the source of all the woes in this country and the source of the destruction of our Constitution and our entire way of life and the destruction of Protestantism in the country. True Bible-believing Protestantism to be replaced by popery. I'll see you tomorrow on Inquisition Update. Visit CrossTheBorder.org C-R-O-S-S CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. That's CrossTheBorder.org I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation the image of the beast and the mark of the beast and the truth about God's chosen people and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossTheBorder.org.